G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, continuing this off-season series where I go through each club in the AFL and do a little bit of a breakdown of where they're at, uh, talking about the most recent season, their off-season changes, trying to have a crack at their best 22, and uh, generally trying to analyze what I think the team lacks, both uh, in their immediate team and potentially longer term as well. And today, we are doing the Richmond Football Club. If you weren't aware, I've been going through the league in reverse alphabetical order, which means there's a Bulldogs, Eagles, Sydney, St Kilda video already out on the channel. And today we're doing the Mighty Richmond Football Club. So if you are interested in checking those out, there's a playlist on my channel, um, but also make sure you are subscribed as well. As an aside, I'm really glad I decided to do this series. Um, it's not necessarily banging views, but I must say it's uh, as much as anything, it's really helped me familiarize with teams on a more in-depth level. And it's kind of shattered some potentially illusions I had uh, about certain teams. And uh, with Richmond, it's been good to get a better understanding of exactly where they're at because I have talked about them in a bit on this channel. But um, my general thoughts going into this video were Richmond's are very much an aside in transition. Having you know, been such a mighty team for years, we've kind of been waiting for the drop-off to happen. Uh, in 2022, they still made finals. So 21, they missed finals. 22, they came back in a uh, pretty strong fashion. Then this year, the, it sort of fell apart a little bit. So uh, the point of this video is to kind of analyze what happens next for Richmond as well and looking at their best 22. But this year was one full of drama for Richmond, uh, more so in an off-field sense. And when I say drama, I just mean, I guess the emotional um, farewell of Damien Hardwick, the probably the best coach this football club has ever seen and certainly one of the best coaches of the modern era. And now he's gone and joined the Gold Coast Suns and they've had a couple of retiring legends. So there's certainly a changing of the guard here more sense than one. So they're, they're at a precarious time. Uh, it, it's an interesting time to sort of project where they're gonna go next. The new coach, Adam Uze at the helm. Could there be a bit of a different strategic focus? Is that club gonna look at where they're at and uh, potentially undertake a bit more of a rebuild focus? I suppose that remains to be seen, but they could undertake that sort of approach of other strong clubs in the AFL era of trying to avoid rebuilding. And sometimes it works, you know, Geelong never rebuilt really. Sydney sort of had a quick fire one. Hawthorne did undertake a rebuild and West Coast kind of fell into one. And I chose those four clubs because I think statistically they're the most successful over that period. But obviously it's a new landscape now. You know, Damien Hardwick's uh, not retirement, but uh, his decision to leave the Richmond Footy Club was unforeseen, that has to be said. And he sort of burns out and now has a renewed energy and well enough to go uh, coach Gold Coast, I suppose. But they're an interesting list management case study as well, having traded for uh, Tim Taranto and Jacob Hopper, effectively trading out of two drafts to try and bolster their best 22 in the short term or medium term, we'd say, because they're still players in their prime. They're not, uh, they're not gonna be retiring anytime soon. But there's a clear drop off in terms of veterans about to leave the club over the next few years. And I can see why Taranto and Hopper would serve to help that transition, uh, it has to be said. And this year, you know, while things didn't go to plan, there's a few positives. I mean, the fact that they kind of stayed within reach of the finals race, um, it, even though they didn't really get close, like they still stayed in touch in a year where a lot of things were going wrong. Um, a couple of players on earth, I think in particular, Tyler Young as a key defensive option when they've got quite a few aging key defenders, it has to be said. Robbie Tarrant's left the club, for instance. Tyler Young established himself as one of the best one-on-one -on -one defenders this year, uh, which was quite impressive, but we'll go into more depth about that. Obviously, Tim Taranto had a successful first season at Richmond as well, uh, being one of the best players, well, one of the best performed midfielders throughout the course of the season. Let's talk about uh, how their off-season went from a, a list changes point of view. So the players that left the club, were Jack Rewalt and Trent Cotchen, obviously absolute legends of that football club. Another premiership hero in Jason Castagna. Robbie Tarrant also left after a few years at North Melbourne. He's retired. Ivan Soldo got traded to Port Adelaide. And then a couple of other ones in Kalen Bradkey. Hope I'm saying that right. And Begoa Nguyen also got a trade to the North Melbourne Football Club as a key defensive prospect. So in terms of their additions, uh, the one player that they traded in was Jacob Kaczynski, sorry. And then they drafted with two picks, Kane McAuliffe, Liam Fawcett, and most recently, I think they've signed uh, Sam Naismith, the former Sydney Ruckman, who's been playing pretty well in the VFL from memory. But on top of that, what they did do this year, while their hands were tied from a draft capital point of view, like obviously trading out of two respective drafts hasn't given them the access of talent, which is the kind of the premise for me thinking potentially their list is not in great shape. But what I do admire about what they did this offseason was um, trade both prior to the draft and live trade for more points next year or more picks next year to 
potentially trade with other clubs who have you know father sons. There's, there's a heap of father sons in next year's draft. Richmond have put themselves in a good position to get some really high draft picks next year, regardless of where they actually finish on the ladder. So let's talk about their best 22 and how I see it shaping up. So plotting Richmond's best 22 was tough because in some cases you got to split between young players on the cusp of making it into the team and, and it could actually eventuate that they do get picked over some senior players this year. And there's a lot of evenness outside the best 22 of this Richmond team. Um, I've, I've picked Tyler Young and Noah Bolter as the key backs with Grimes as a back pocket. I did notice in research for this video a bit of anti-Grimes sentiment, people suggesting they don't want him in the team for round one. But I'm going to err on the side of conservatism here and say that Uzo probably does pick Grimes in the round one team. But what happens from there, I'm not too sure. Because it is a tall back line. I've got Bolter, Young, and Grimes in there. All is somewhat key defensive players. I know there's a bit of talk and Noah Bolter playing forward. I don't know enough about that to, to change my best 22. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, but we've also got Nathan Broad on the bench there. So Josh Kipkis is a, one, a player that I wanted to put into this team. But as a key defensive prospect, I think he's also coming, well, he is coming back from injury. Not sure if he's going to be ready for round one anyway. Uh, but he's one that they can put phase into the team over time. He can develop. He's a key position talent that's young, a uh, top 10 prospect uh, back in 2021 anyway. So I decided to err on the side of patience with that. Uh, looking at their midfield, you know, that starting midfield, provided they're all fit, is pretty strong with Prestia, Taranto, and Hopper as their three main on ballers. I've chucked Bolton on a wing now. I know he probably doesn't really belong on a wing as such. He's more of a forward on baller. And Jack Ross on the other wing. Um, so I'd say potentially that's... One area I would probably look to recruit for if I was Richmond, some outside class. And Liam Baker as well is also going to rotate through the midfield, as is Dusty, presumably. Jack Graham is another midfield option there. So there's a few rotation options there. But I think the outside class is what I'd probably look to enhance from their perspective. Jacob Kaczynski is the only new player in that best 22, I'd say. And like I said, I have picked it. Uh, conservatively this team and uh, Noah Cumberland also makes into this team just. Judson Clark is arguably probably one you could put in that forward pocket instead of Cumberland and switch them out as a sub but I'll defer to Richmond fans on what they think about that. So I'd like to have, I'd like to see a bit more youth injected into this team. Um, and while they haven't had access to talent, there's a few kids that want to rotate through this team. So I, I did leave out Camden McIntosh. I just found him to be the unlucky one. But again, I think I think don't think he had the greatest season. He averaged about 14 touches last year. Gibkiss is another player left out. But some other players, young prospects that I think we will see feature this year. Tom Brown and Sam Banks in particular. Uh, I do notice a, kind of an oversupply of running defenders on this list as well. James Trezize, I think that's how you say it, uh, is another player who could play. Jacob Bauer, I think, has his fans as well. Again, just players on the cusp. They might not start, start round one, but I think depending on how Richmond's season goes this year, they, they need, well, I think that regardless of how it goes, they need to phase in some of these guys and get opportunities. Uh, Matt Coltard is another one. Tyler Sonzi, again, he was uh, a highly rated prospect in his year. Remember, he slid a little bit in 2021. And I don't think he's actually that close to the team, but he's, he's worth mentioning as well. Hugo Ralph Smith. Sam Naismith is probably there more as depth. And then Morris Rioli Jr. too. So there's a bunch of young players there, and I probably haven't even named them all, who are worth experimenting in this team, provided they can get some stability with their best 22. If they can come in and you know get a bit of exposure in a functioning team, that would be best for their development. But what I think can't happen this year for Richmond is they you know pick an experience lined up week in, week out. There's a lack of development of youth, and say they finish middle of the table at best, I think that would be the worst outcome here because the way I see it, Going forward, they don't have all the pieces for the next premiership team. So developing that next you know, young core, which is arguably not on their list yet, is going to be key. I'd also highlight that the young midfield talent is probably... There's a lack of obvious young midfield talent in this team as well. I mean, Taranto and Hopper, obviously, are relatively new players there. They traded out picks. I had a look at who they probably could have taken had they not draft, uh, traded for those players. I think Elijah Hewitt was one of the players taken with uh, the picks they traded away. Then looking forward as well, I mean, pick 31 that year became, I think it became absorbed by GWS's academy match for Ralston, but it may have got them guys like Hustwade and Hotton. And then it was also GWS's pick this year, and that would have given them access to Daniel Curtin, Caddy, or O'Sullivan if they were picking tall. So again, this, the point of this video is not really to, to criticize the trade as such. It's just worth considering that that's, uh, that's the position they kind of put themselves in by trading for Taranto and Hopper. But I, I'm kind of comfortable with the decision they made. But going back to their midfield, you know, under that, you've got Thompson Dow, who I've picked in this team. Jack Ross is a younger prospect, Tyler Sonzi. But after that, I think, you know, young midfield talent, specifically under 20 talent is what they need to address. Um, forward line, 
And this team is fairly dynamic. You know, Tom Lynch is great there, uh, obviously. And then in terms of Kaczynski, he's got some potential. Um, I think, you know, he's kicking about 48 goals or something like that from the first 50 games. I've got those numbers wrong. But in terms of output, I think he's actually been solid. So he's one that obviously could be a bit of a surprise impact. But I think just acting as a foil this year for, for Tom Lynch would uh, would improve Richmond's forward line. Then also some dynamic small players in there, Shea Bolton. Uh, Liam Baker and Dustin Martin, of course. So talking about what I think they need from here, um, like I said, I did notice a a lot of medium defenders drafted in recent times. You know, there's uh, Tom Brown, Sam Banks that I mentioned, Trezise, Ralph Smith's kind of a smaller defender. Caleb Smith, they drafted out of East Fremantle. Uh, Steely Green from South Fremantle. I'm not sure exactly how they've developed Steely Green. Uh, He's kind of a friend of a friend, so I paid attention. But he was kind of more of a halfback when he was drafted, so I'm not sure exactly where he'll end up. But I feel like the, the way to sort of describe Richmond's young talent on this list, it's not a case of nurturing gun talent that we know are going to come good. They just need exposure. They're still going through this phase of finding out if some of these kids are actually AFL standard. There's not clear cut options there. They're going to have to mix and match a little bit, but that's going to be an important focus this year. Now, Richmond fans, like in general, and this is kind of common for a lot of fans of teams who have just had a successful era. There's a little bit of a denial, in my opinion, about their own club's ability to bounce back. And to some extent, like the Richmond, they could be right about Richmond. I mean, they bounced back in 2022, but... It was the same thing with Hawks fans and, of course, the same thing with Eagles fans, and I include myself in that number, who thought, yes, things have fallen apart now, but uh, because we've been successful, we will become successful again in the short term. But I'm not necessarily saying Richmond's a spoon contender either. I I don't actually believe that. Unless something goes horribly wrong or they completely switch up their focus this year, I think they're... The quality of that team is it's too good to finish bottom four, but it is competitive. I don't know exactly who is going to finish bottom four. But my point being here, even the most bullish Richmond fans would have to agree it's time for them to try and get high draft picks. And like I said, I do like the strategy they've employed of accumulating picks for next year so that then, you know, if they still have the freedom to try and win as many games as next year and, and become, you know, a team in and around the eighth, potentially, like best case scenario, in my opinion. But if they have all this draft collateral already locked and loaded and they can do trades next year, they're probably going to have access to high draft picks anyway. So I think they're in a good position from that point of view. But in terms of what they need, like in, I think because they haven't had access to high draft picks the last two years, I still think they're early days in their transition, maybe not rebuild, but transition. And it's somewhat of a blank canvas. They can go tall, they can go small. They, they kind of need everything other than maybe medium defenders. I'd probably look at midfield talents. Um, obviously, they've drafted a couple midfielders. Well, certainly uh, McAuliffe is an inside mid. Maybe they go for some outside class, young outside talent. Potentially still another key position defender and maybe someone as well to pair up with Gibkiss. So I think the needs are across the board, which is, is a good position to be in in a sense because then they can just pick best available. What I'd be doing for them as well, and I've said this in a previous video, is that I think they're in a really good position to actually explore free agency this year in a way that doesn't force them to try and trade for players so if they can get some free agents and pay them enough they should have some money in the bank i think dusty martin comes out of contract this year they've obviously had retirements as well they're going to have a bit of a war chest i would have thought so trying to get match a bid for a player which that club can't match and prize them loose of their club i think that is actually a pretty good move for richmond to continue the list transition maybe another midfielder to join Toronto and Hopper, ensure that the team is competitive while they're still getting access to draft picks. What they need to do is preserve their access to draft picks. But there's a few good free agents on the market this year. Hugh McCluggage, Andrew McGrath, potentially, Ben Ainsworth from the Gold Coast Suns, uh, even Jared Berry or something. Now, I'm not saying any of those players would leave their club, but I'm just saying Richmond should probably have a sniff because they can add those players, improve their best 22, smooth out the transition, remain potentially competitive for a little bit longer, and it won't hurt their draft situation. In terms of the list changes next year as well, I mean, I don't know who their retirements necessarily will be. Is it Dusty Martin's last year? I think he turns 33 in 2024. Dylan Grimes is another player that could be forced out, and I'd say... Grimes could be one that makes way. I feel more confident betting on Grimes retiring than Dusty. I feel like Dusty can play for as long as he wants. It's just a case of how long he wants to play for. So to summarize, I think Richmond's... I'm not going to bank on them uh, finishing in the eight, of course. I mean, I just did a couple of ladder predictions where I I think I had them third last. So I'm not going to hedge my bets and just say, no, they'll probably make the top eight. I I do think they'll, they'll miss the eight. I think they don't quite have that best 22 quality to match it with some of those other teams. Where it comes down for Richmond is what has been a hallmark of their team over the years has been, uh, like I said in the Saints video, it's, it's, it's an ability to commit and execute a game plan and a style. We're going to see a new coach who is going to be experimenting with both the list and potentially the game style and, and players are going to be adapting to it. 
that I see potential for Richmond to slip a little bit this year. I know their fans will disagree for the most part, um, and I don't think they're a spoon contender. I don't, I don't look at that list and think there's a chance they go all the way to 18th. But on popular opinion, I think it's almost probably in their best interest to fall pretty far down the ladder. I mean, if they're going to finish 12th, they might as well finish 15th and get a top five pick. Unpopular thing to say, I know, but I think that would probably be the best outcome for Richmond because while the team is not horrible, I still think they need to act now to avoid what would be a fall off the cliff in a few years if they don't try and transition this list. But anyway, guys, those are just my thoughts on the Richmond Football Club. Again, I'm an outsider uh, trying to analyze a club that I don't support and watch absolutely every week. So let me know in the comments what you agree with and disagree with. What are your predictions for Richmond this year, whether you go for Richmond or not? I'd uh, like to hear from you. So thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.